Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another video of History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Charles Haberl. He is an expert on the Mandian religion, and he co-translated the Mandian Book of John alongside James McGrath, Dr. James McGrath. And this is my final interview, in-person interview, for the, uh, regarding the SBL conference that has occurred from, occurring from November 18th to the 21st of November in 2023. A link to purchase uh, the, the Mandian Book of John will be in the description below, the History Valley Amazon affiliate link. And with that being said, thank you for joining me today, Charles. Thank you very much for having me here. I would like to start off with this question uh, before I ask questions directly about the content of the book. Mm -hmm. When you were doing the translation work on the book alongside James, um, what kind of work did you have to do? What, what, what was it like, et cetera? Well, we had a system. Uh, it mm -hmm. took a long time, basically. I mean, almost 10 years from the start to finish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the first part of that was doing our due diligence, looking at all the manuscripts that are available in collections around the world. In many cases, they had not been digitized before. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always convenient to just pop off to the library to look at the copies. So we had right. to ask them to, to digitize them for us. And so we were able to look not only at the originals in, in most cases, but also at, uh, you know, really, really nice digital images of them so we could blow them up and, and right. look at the individual characters and see whether the scribes had made any mistakes or corrections or changes. Um, and so that, that improved our translation, I think, immensely. We looked at other translations as well. You know, there's a German translation from a little over 100 years ago, uh, which was quite good, uh, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it was done in a time when there were no you know, dictionaries or grammars of this language. So, you know, I have to give my, my hats off to, to Mark Litzbarski for his translation because mm. it's a masterpiece considering the constraints he was working under. And there's stuff in Arabic as well uh, that came out later, but mm. Mandayans themselves have been working on translating their own sacred texts and they bring their own uh, particular interpretation to the text as well, which is at times also incorporate some of what Western scholarship has said about it. So, you know, you have to be aware of those things because you want to understand how these texts have been received by their communities. What is the Mandan Book of John? I'm going to ask in case there's what was in the audience. I've never heard of this type of book before. Mm. Well, it's interesting. It's, uh, it is a miscellany of texts, uh, the biggest chunk of which, not the majority of the book, but say the biggest single chunk mm -hmm. of which is about John the Baptist, who is this... Uh, uh, particular role within Mendaism, not as the founder of the religion by any means, and not as the innovator of any of the traditions like the, the ritual of baptism, but just simply one of their most recent and present and important prophets. And mm -hmm. so um, they, they are defined by their baptism in flowing water, which is something they do frequently. And of course, he's known historically as someone who also practiced the same ritual from the text, the sacred texts of the Christians and Muslims most principally. So uh, the book itself is about that. There's another figure in there as well, whom I argue in many ways prefigures John the Baptist. At least a lot of the stories told about her in the various Mandayan texts also seem to accumulate around John the Baptist too. And that's mm -hmm. Merie. Uh, um, Merie is a, um, is a kind of a prophetess. And uh, she... Um, she was born to a Jewish community in Jerusalem, apparently to a priestly family. She converted to, uh, to Mandaism, and she was rejected by her own community, but embraced by the Mandaeans. And so and she becomes a teacher and a prophetess. And, you know, in, in the book of John, she's portrayed as sitting by the banks of a river, the river Euphrates, um, preaching to the birds and the fishes, arraigned in white with a staff, and very much like a priestess. So uh, she's another figure who has a very important role in this religion. But there's some apocalyptic stuff in there. There's quite a lot of teachings. Uh, there's all kinds of material. There's stuff about the beginning of the world, cosmogonies. So mm -hmm. it's comparable to other religious texts, like particularly like the Bible, in, in its breadth. It's smaller than the Bible, but it's still quite broad in terms of its approach to the sort of questions that we interrogate uh, sacred texts about. Mm. How does the book view the creation of the world? Ah, that's a complicated matter. So we have, um, so it begins with this episode of a kind of a war in heaven between these various mm -hmm. divine figures. It starts off with a series of emanations and 
we really kind of have to go to other men dying texts as well to fill in the gaps because it doesn't present it to you. It's not like, you know, Mandaism 101 for someone who doesn't know anything about the religion. This is a text that was used by the community who is presumed to know much of its background. And um, we know that they teach that there's a progressive series of emanations um, from the Mana Rabba Kabiro, the great first, uh, the, uh, um, the great first Mana, you know, the sort of principle of intellect that existed before everything else, from whom springs uh, life, which are the, the flowing waters, from whom uh, springs a first life and a second life and a third life and so on and so forth. And each of these lives has its own distinct name and character. And uh, the, the, the metaphor for this is something like the metaphor of a fruit, which brings mm -hmm. forth seeds, which produce more fruits and so on and so forth. So very, very often, many of these figures that populate the thought world of the Mandaeans are described uh, in terms of features of nature. So drops of water, fruits, and so on and so forth uh, to make manifest this comparison with, uh, with fruits and other things that emanate and create life. Um, uh, there's a, a tale about how Yoshamin, who is the second life, becomes sort of too big for his britches. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a war between him and the other uh, Uthri, who are these sort of um, these figures of the world of light that result in him being cast down. I think that's one of the first steps into this progressive um, series of creations, each of which is worse than the last. So, you know, Yoshamin wants to have his own, um, create his own world and have his own Ethri and his son, uh, his, his next, the next life or the third life, Awathor, uh, similarly does. And he produces his own son, who's Ebtahil, who creates this material world. So when you think about it, the world in which we live, this material world, is about the furthest thing you can from this transcendent world of light. It's mm -hmm. We only reach it via a series of, of emanations of the sort. Mm. And that individual you were talking about that was cast down, would, is, would it be fair to say that that, is that is that the equivalent of Satan's rebellion in heaven and his fall? Yeah. Or is Satan a separate character in the Mandiam of John? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say there, there, there are Satans that appear in the mm -hmm. incantations and in some of the texts, but uh, there's no exact Satan. And it's hard to say because he's still the second life, right? Mm -hmm. He is an emanation of the, the first life. Um, so... While there's some aspects of him that resemble this sort of backstory known from Milton and other authors about this war mm -hmm. in heaven, and um, uh, at, by the same token, all of these figures become redeemed in the end. So like mm -hmm. Awathor is a supremely important figure within the Mandayan religion. Even at the end of time, Ibtahil, the demiurge, the guy who creates the material world in which we find ourselves, uh, he becomes redeemed and he becomes sort of the ruler of this world mm -hmm. once it's restored. Um, and, and all the people, all the souls that are within it are, are there basically because of him now, for better or worse. So I would say that uh, although Yoshamin is kind of satanic in this way, in this mm -hmm. being this rebellious, proud, haughty figure, uh, he also has an important role just simply because of his, his, uh, his position within the lineage from, from the first life. Mm -hmm. And how how does the how does it view God, the ultimate creator, the first the first God? Uh, the first God. Well, I mean, the first print. It's kind of hard because just like a mm -hmm. fruit that bears, you know, seeds that produce trees that produce more fruit, um, they're all basically the same thing. So, like, mm -hmm. if we consider, for example, the Mano Rabba, the the first intellect, the, the great intellect, to be the first principle of. Uh, from which life and the waters emit, um, basically saying this this being, this 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 uh, prime mover, this primordial being in the Mandayan religion, um, sort of is a, aloof from creation. It, mm -hmm. You know, he is shielded from the consequences of his offspring's actions, right? To the extent that they become proud and haughty, like Yoshamin, or they create a material world by getting involved with the, the, the powers of darkness, so to speak. Um, you know, the, uh, every once in a while, he will intervene very often by sending forth, for example, Mendote to the material world to fix some of the mistakes that have occurred, right? Like, so for example, Ibtahil is inspired by Ruha, who's the, 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 the sort of demonic um, 
Holy Spirit of the Mendian religion. She kind of seduces the, the, the Iptahil and says, let's create a human being. And, uh, and he tries to infuse this being with animate life. And it works, but the being is kind of like an animal crawling on the ground. This is the first uh, Adam. And it's only when, um, to combat the forces of darkness, Mendotei descends and provides the human being with the Neshemta, with the soul, that it's able to actually have this intellect that is also characteristic of all these light world beings. Hmm. Um, so Mendotei is kind of like, in this sense, it's, it's, a, it's a representation. It's a, it, uh, Mendotei is a, an extension of the first manas uh, being into this world to kind of fix the problems that have been created by some of uh, his offspring. Hmm. And who is Avatar, the judge? Yes, that's uh, I call him Awathor. That's hmm. sometimes how they pronounce him in, in the vernacular mandate. Hmm. Uh, so one, the, the primal Mendian principles is that there are, in fact, two sides to every coin, right? And, you know, the, the idea is that just as the right is stronger than the, the left, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there are opposing forces, for example, light and darkness, good and evil. So there are often two figures who represent each of these progressive emanations. Uh, there's a author who is in some of the texts identified with, in, in my opinion, with Hebel Zewel, one of these light world beings, who is the third life, the third emanation of the life. And there's Awathar Mozani, who is the Awathar of the scales. And that is the figure who judges the souls of the dead when they ascend, the dead men dying, of course, when they ascend. So they go up into, uh, they, they're judged by Awathar and his scales. And, um, he weighs their sins, and they go off to something called Matarofi. Uh, the Matarofi are the purgatories in which their souls atone. Um, and there are a couple more steps in there, but he's basically responsible for the judging of the dead in that sense by weighing their souls. Uh, the, um, the other Awathar doesn't have that role, and Mendines to this day will say that these are actually two different Awathars. Or Abathars. Hmm. And who is the Manda de Haya? So that's the save. That's one of the savior spirits. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the things, some of the feats attributed to, to Mendote, the Mendo de Haya, are also attributed to Hebel Zewa, who, who uh, and in some respects they are very similar. But um, uh, you could translate his name in Aramaic. Not everyone would agree that you should do this, but you could translate his name as knowledge of life, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a Mendayan would quite obviously say, well, that's not his name. His name is Mendote. So, you know, call him Mendote. Don't translate it knowledge of life. So that there's a translator's question there that we can bracket for the moment. But um, whenever he appears in the text, he is there to enlighten people on this fallen world, right? Uh, the knowledge about what really happens out there, right? This, this, this aspect, which is the most mm -hmm. Gnostic of Mandaism, which is to say that... Mendines are only who they are because they have inside knowledge from the worlds of light, which is brought to them by Mendelte. That's why he's the savior spirit. Does that have to do with like revealing the hidden light that the text frequently talks about? Mm. Well, there are a lot of things that are secrets or hidden. Um, basically, starting with Ipta Hill, who himself is a sort of a, a product of both life and darkness. His mother was a Lilith, right? So it, this has to go back to Hebel Zewo's descent into the underworld where he encounters this Lilith and he saves her from captivity in the, uh, in the worlds of darkness. Um, and they have a child who is Ibtahil, Tahil. And uh, uh, this child goes on to create the world. Uh, and he is exactly half Lilith, half being from the world of light, uh, which makes him a figure not unlike all of us in the material world. And, you know, Part of us is this creation that was inspired by Ruha for evil. And part of us is this intellect or the spirit that, um, that Mandate brings down from the worlds of light to kind of animate us, without which we would be just like animals in the field. Does the text have a messi messianic figure that will come back and, uh, and uh, defeat evil, like we see in some other religions, like in Christianity? 
there are certainly apocalyptic aspects to the text, uh, and that role is fulfilled by several beings. One of the most common is Anish Ufra, who is this figure who is most, in most of the texts he's associated either with Merye or with uh, John the Baptist, with the destruction of Jerusalem. After the Jews destroy the Tarmidi, who are the disciples of John, or of Merye, depending on whom, which text you're reading, um, Enosh Ithra comes down and he just wipes out everyone in Jerusalem. And mm. at the end of time, right, after all of the time, all the, the years that have been allotted to these children of Ruha, the children of the evil spirit, right? She has this um, kind of weird incestuous relationship with her, her son and her brother and her father and so on and so forth. And each of them produces uh, another like cadre of, of evil spirits, right? The five governors, the 12 signs of the zodiac, the seven visible planets, all these are the products of these incestuous unions. And so um, they are allotted as part of their contract with Ibtahil, the creator of this world. They are allotted a certain amount of time. After that time runs out, Ruha's son, Ur, this giant serpent, which is kind of like the Leviathan, will come and devour all of his creations. And then they, they basically start from scratch. Uh, in a new creation, which um, is perfectly pure, is all light and has nothing to do with the darkness. Hmm. And I want to ask about that. That, that the, it seems like there's a conflict there that's being portrayed between John the Baptist and his followers, followers of the Jews of Jerusalem. So does does it seem like that John is portrayed as having as in, in, as being an opponent of Torah orthodoxy? It's funny, uh, this is one of these questions that changes depending upon the text you're reading. Mm -hmm. I would say in the book of John, he comes out almost as if he were a purely Jewish figure and almost a defender mm. uh, of orthodoxy in a, a very real sense. So like the book of John, particularly in its 18th chapter, makes a very strong point about his Jewish lineage and how Zechariah, Abba Saba Zachariah, who was his father, uh, descends from the same line that all of the prophets of Israel have descended from. And so the book of John really puts a strong line on that to talk about him as being sort of almost like the fulfillment of Jewish law in a sense, in a way that, for example, Christians would view uh, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say that this is true about every text. And in fact, uh, in other Mandaean texts, he doesn't fulfill the same rule. I, I just think that the book of John in particular has the most sort of Judeophilic approach to John the Baptist that all of the presentations of John the Baptist in Mandaean literature have. So, you know, one of the interesting, one of the really exciting things about Mandaean literature is that you get multiple versions of the same story, right? It's almost like people gathering around a campfire at night and telling ghost stories. And, you know, you, the stories are familiar, but they're told in slightly different ways with tweaks and differences. and that is when you look at the the long history of Mandaic literature, which clearly goes back hundreds and thousands of years. When you look at it, there are so many versions of different stories. You have to do a lot of work to kind of reconcile them. And this is this is work that Mandaeans have done. This is work that Western scholars have tried to do for Mandaeans. Um, but the upshot of it is is that there are, are different portrayals of what happened in Jerusalem about the birth and the origins of John the Baptist, about his relationship with this community in different Mandaean works. So how is John the Baptist portrayed in general in, in, in the book of John? In the book of John, uh, he is, at times, he comes off as a bit, you know, he, he, he is a teacher, first and foremost, right? He has admonitions for his community. Uh, one of the things about John that struck me most when I was translating this book was, the story about his wife um, and about how when he came close to uh, his death, his wife was saying, oh, I'm going to build you a great vault and you'll have a lovely tomb and all of this. And he says, I don't need these things. This, my body is just, you know, it's what's left of the material me on this world, which is not that great a world anyway, right? You know, we're, we're so close here to the world of, worlds of darkness. So, you know, don't bother, basically. And, and I thought, well, that's, you know, he sounds a bit curmudgeonly, but this is very true to the Mandaean conceptions of the world and our place within it. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, one of the 
incidents in the book of John that I think most people keep coming back to uh, and that uh, Professor McGrath and I sometimes have a bit of a more nuanced approach to, I think, is that uh, there is an episode in which he is confronted by Jesus, who, as in the Christian tradition, is one of John's disciples in a sense. And Jesus comes to him and says, I need you to baptize me. And, you know, if you mention me in your book, then I will mention you in my book as well. You know, kind of you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of deal. And uh, John is in, in, initially, he's very hesitant to do any such thing. And he says, okay, I tell you what, there are a series of questions. And if you can answer these things, you are a very wise Messiah. And that's the interesting thing. He uses this term Messiah for Jesus as well. He says, if you can answer these questions I pose to you, then you're a very wise Messiah and I will baptize you. And so he poses a, a, a bunch of brain teasers, like, you know, an, a stone that has been oiled cannot become wet. What does this mean? Uh, they're almost Zen-like uh, in, in, these, in, in their form. And, uh, you know, Jesus, to his credit, manages to come up with a, a very credible story explaining how these things actually work in the world. So he says, look, here's what you mean by that. This is a, a parable. This is, the stone is an allegory, and so on and so forth. So after a series of these questions are answered, John says, I still don't want to baptize him. And at this point, a letter descends from, from Awatha, from the house of Awatha, from the house of the third life, and says, just baptize him. You know, go ahead and do it. So then he has to do this. And at that moment, Ruha, who is, in addition to being kind of the evil spirit, also the mother of all the religions in the world, save for Mandaism, she descends. She says, this is brilliant. I'm taking down notes. Now, you know, this baptism you're doing right now, that's going to be the model for the, the Christian font, the baptismal font. And, you know, your magna, which is the staff that you hold on to, which is an old Parthian word. That is the, the, going to be the, the model for the, the bishop's crozier and all kinds of other things, you know. The petha and the mambuha that you drink and you eat when you are doing the baptism, those are going to be the models for the Eucharistic, the host and, and the blood of the Eucharist. So basically what this chapter says is that, yes, Jesus was baptized by John, and at the instigation of the worlds of light, by the way, but it allowed Ruha this evil spirit who is the mother of all the things that are bad about this world to kind of crib down notes and be able to create a new religion, which would be Christianity out of this incident. Hmm. Is there a conflict at all between John the Baptist and Jesus and Mandian literature? Yeah. You know, uh, it's not so much between John. The, and this is one of the few encounters the two of them have basically mm -hmm. in Mandian literature. I think the main conflict happens, you know, in, in one of the stories, uh, Christ is pre presented as sort of like a shapeshifter. He changes colors and his eyes mm -hmm. roll. The conflict then is between him and, uh, and you know, and Ishtar and these others. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that the conflict is necessarily between. I mean, that chapter of the book of John in which John kind of challenges him with questions and Jesus responds with some surprisingly cogent and thoughtful answers. That's the closest it comes to a real conflict between them. But it's not the sort of conflict you would think about more naturally in the history of religion. Mm -hmm. What is the book of visions that is uh, referenced as having been bestowed mm -hmm. upon Benjamin? It's a good question. So in the infancy story, the, the birth story of John the Baptist in, in the book, um, there is talk about this book of visions, which I think refers to um, almost like a guide to dreams, right? Because this all starts with, you know, um, uh, Abba Saba Zechariah's visions. And, uh, you know, they need to interpret, sorry, sorry, not, not him, Eliezer's visions about Abba, Abba Saba Zechariah. So, so Zachary, you know, Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, is, you know, in, in his dotage. He's an older figure. He's not expected to have many more children. Mm -hmm. But the chief priest of the Jews, right, Eliezer, Eleazar, um, has this dream in the night. And so that's why they need to fetch the Book of Vision. And such a work does not, to my knowledge, exist within the canon of Mandaean literature. And because this story is situated in Jerusalem in a specifically Jewish context, I'm not even sure that it is intended to be a Mandaian work. 
it may actually be Jewish for all we know. Uh, but you know, we know from reading the Hebrew Bible, for example, that the, the, the interpretation of dreams in the stories of Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh was one of the areas in which Jews excelled. And I think that's one reason why this becomes part of the John story as well, that you have a series of dreams and visions and that their interpretation provides the key for the future greatness of this prophetic figure, right? He has to be heralded by dreams because all these other important events in the history of the Jewish people were also heralded by figures in power having dreams. So you think that this book of visions is probably a lost text at the Mandian book of John is referring to? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely lost insofar as mm -hmm. we don't have it. Like, I, I wish I could call up the book of visions and say, okay, you know, <laughs> well, that's what that dream means. Oh, uh, there are similar divinatory uh, works that circulate in Mandian circles, like the book of the Zodiac is one of them. Uh, but that's not the book of visions, right? It's the book of the Zodiac. And Mandians use that, for example, to determine, well, not just, you know, when are the auspicious and inauspicious days on which to do something? It's very much like geomancy in this way. I'm talking mm -hmm. about feng shui in, in, in the East, but it's not just like that. It's also about like what happens if someone gets sick. Well, a lot depends upon their birth date and the hour on which they were born, whether they'll, re they'll recover or not. And so it's about divining amina um, and the circumstances of one's birth and place in the world and using extrapolating from that information about how they will fare in the future. It's to predict the future that way through the Zodiac insofar as which signs were governing the birth of the person, the Mandayan. Um, but no, we don't have any books of vision. And I, you know, I couldn't tell you whether there were books in other traditions, specific books to which this refers, right? We know about compendia of, of visions and dreams and such like that. You know, this, this whole field in the Greco-Roman world, in, 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 the, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, even in the Mesopotamian context. We know that people interpreted in divine dreams, but which of those books to which this refers, I don't know. So yeah, you could characterize it as a lost book. Is, is Jesus understood as the son of God or, or at the least a son of a, of a spirit being at all, or not really? Well... So that we have to go to the book of Inner Haran or Harangwetha. Mm -hmm. So in the Harangwetha, it refers to a Miriam, um, not Mirye, who is another figure, but Miriam, who Mendines are quite clear is not the same as their prophetess. Mm -hmm. But this Miriam is the mother of Jesus, right? In some texts, he's referred to as, as Isho Bar Mariam. And uh, it says in the Harangwetha, if I remember, that something was put into her, was created and not born. And so the birth of Jesus in the Mandayan tradition, at least insofar as it's instantiated by the, the Harangwetha, by the book, the book of Inner Haran, is that it's unnatural. And, you know, it, it, it seems also that the tradition that he was of a virgin birth also applies there as well. So um, in that sense, they do seem to agree with the Christian tradition. Now, they don't always, obviously, even when it comes to Jesus, mm -hmm. who is, rather pointedly also Mandayan literature, a Christian figure, right? They don't try to appropriate him. They don't say he's one of our prophets. They say, this guy is definitely, he belongs to the Christians. Uh, but yeah, they don't say that he is, for example, the son of God or a God or a figure from the world of light. And if I'm not mistaken, they don't actually say who it was who put him into the womb mm -hmm. of Marie. Maybe it was Ruha. She seems to be the source of a lot of different religious division in the world. So it could have been her. So it seems like to me that in general, um, based on what you're saying, so John, the, the figure of John the Baptist is the one that's being given lots of elevation. Yeah. And Jesus is being heavily downplayed. Yep. Right. So although Jesus is dignified with the title of Mshiho, Messiah, in the book of John, especially in that one chapter in which he, he and John are having this back and forth about the baptism. Mm -hmm. Although they call him Mshiho, elsewhere in the text, they refer to him as the Mshiho Dogolo, right? The, uh, the, the, the lying Messiah, the deceiving Messiah, almost mm -hmm. the Antichrist. So the false Messiah, shall we say. So even if he's not described that in that one chapter, elsewhere he is described as being someone who presents himself as the Messiah, but he's lying. And I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, definitely, he is not a central figure for Mandayans. 
There is no prayer to Jesus. There's no description of how he died for our sins, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, John the Baptist, however, comes off uh, quite well, right? He is one of their best teachers and prophets. And I can't help but be reminded of Josephus, right? Flavius Josephus, the Roman Jewish historian, who knows a lot about John the Baptist and says wonderful things about John the Baptist and reflects that at least at the time that Josephus was writing, John the Baptist was a big deal. And he only has a few things to say about Jesus. And most people, a lot of scholars think that these are actually pious interpolations, that someone came back and said, how could Josephus be writing so much about uh, John the Baptist, not about Jesus, whom John the Baptist is supposed to be the forerunner for, right? Mm -hmm. He's the one who's announcing, the way, preparing the way for Jesus to come. So someone, one of the copyists of Josephus in the Middle Ages said to themselves, well, I'm going to fix this, right? You know, maybe it disappeared. Maybe Josephus napped one day and he forgot to add all this great stuff about Jesus. But, you know, the, 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 the testimony of Josephus about Jesus is kind of a deeply, deeply contested text. And most people say, not only is it not as long as the stuff that he has to say about John the Baptist, but it's also quite um, controversial, shall we say. So that, that reminds me of the situation in the Mandaean religion as well. For Josephus, right, a Jew writing in, a, a Roman Jew, right, someone who had become, um, you know, naturalized to the Roman uh, civilization, uh, John the Baptist is great, Jesus is just neither here nor there. And I think a lot of Mandaeans are like that as well. That's not to say they don't wake up, they don't spend time lying up at night thinking about Jesus. He's just not that important to them. He appears in a few of their texts, but always, you know, at best is a kind of minor nuisance and at worst, you know, something that seems quite demonic. So it seems like that's where some people get the idea from that, um, as we're just saying that in some other texts, Jesus is portrayed as the deceiver, liar, and practically or almost as li like an antichrist. Yeah. So that's where they probably get the idea that Jesus and John the Baptist were enemies and that the Mandians view John the Baptist as the true Messiah and Jesus as the false one. Yeah, Messiah would be a strong term because they don't oh, no. use that term ever to refer to John. Right. But certainly, you know, when in the context, uh, John's birth is miraculous. It's, it's, it's foretold by portents and dreams and visions in the sky and all of this. Uh, uh, John, John is, also does not die in the same way that he does in the Christian tradition. Hmm. Uh, he's not beheaded, nothing like that. Nothing as unsavory as that happens. Um, during part of his youth, according to the Haran Gwaitha or the Inner Haran, he's spirited away to another land where he's raised by uh, figures from the world of light and educated. So, you know, much about him seems supernatural. But at the end of the day, he's not a messiah. He's just another in a long, long series of Mandaean prophets and figures from their, their sacred texts. Mm -hmm. And other scholars have pointed out, he just... When you look at the Genzarabba, for example, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Mandaian, the great treasure of the Mandaeans, uh, he doesn't figure as greatly there as he does in the book of John either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seems to me that although a strong case can be made for his presence in the Mandaean tradition, an equally strong case can be made that over time his role grew, right? We're dealing here with a, a living tradition, one that changes over time. We're not dealing with, oh, some books that were found in an archive somewhere. We're dealing with, with living human beings. Mm -hmm. And of course, over time, their religion evolves. Like you, you only need to look to the history of Christianity as well during the same period to see how much Christianity has evolved from its origins in Roman Palestine to the present date in all of its different instantiations. Now, we only have the one man dying community, but it seems to me that that one man dying community has a much greater appreciation for the figure of John than it would have had 2,000 years ago, shall we say. So when was the Mandian book of John composed? I know it's not composed all at the same time. Yeah. There's a complex history to it. Can you talk about that? Right. So, you know, in my own research, I found what may be some sort of hints to it in the incantation bowls, which are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these terracotta demon traps that have inscriptions upon them. Some of them are in Mandaic and, uh, you know, spare verses and that sort of thing seem to ap appear within them. Uh, and those probably date somewhere between the 5th and the 7th century, the 6th and the 7th century. We're not exactly sure because many of them were not recovered from secure archaeological contexts. Mm -hmm. But um, 
So that suggests to me that portions of the book of John were already circulating before Islam. I will also say that there are colophons in the, uh, at the end of each of these books. Uh, whenever they're copied by uh, a copyist, they add their name and they say a little about the circumstances under which they copied the book. And we always think of the Ganzaraba, the great treasure, as being this like Bible of the Mandaeans. It's bigger than the book of John. It's more impressive. Um, its dating is also complicated. But the colophons in the book of John are even longer than those in the Ganzaraba, which suggests to me, and I believe very strongly, that the book of John has circulated as a complete text for longer than the Ganzaraba has. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that goes to show you how important this text is within the, within the community for a long period of history. I would say that certain portions of it are clearly post-Islamic. Um, of that, I, I would say actually a small minority of the texts within there are. I think that the advent of Islam was an incredibly important um, event, not just for Mandaeans, of course, for Zoroastrians, for Jews, for Christians. It changed all of these religious communities. And I think that Mandaeans kind of memorialized this event mm. in a lot of their sacred texts, including the Haran Guayfa, which refers explicitly to an encounter between um, a figure named Abdullah and uh, um, Anish Bardanka, who is one of the representatives of the Mandaean community in around the middle of the 7th century. So um, getting back to your question of when it was written, um, I do think that some portions of it are very, very ancient. Mm. Um, I personally, based on stylistic things, based upon comparison with other um, Mandaic texts uh, within the Genza, within, some, within the, uh, the canonical prayer book, I think that the Merye sections of the Book of John are among the oldest. Hmm. Uh, because unlike John, who doesn't appear in the canonical prayer book, Merye does, and she's actually quite important in a few prayers. Um, what else is there to say about that? Yeah, I would say, that being said, it's still my opinion that the liturgical stuff, those prayers that appear also in some form within the book of John and the Genzaraba are the heart of the tradition, mm -hmm. right? The liturgy is really the longest, long-standing part of the tradition. And around this is accreted a bunch of different texts, some before the period of Islam for various reasons, some after Islam, uh, and that is how we get to the book of John today. When you talk about those very early incantations in the Mandan Book of John, how early are we talking about? Like, what century are we talking about here? Well, there are lead rolls, um, no, um, or lamellae, as I should probably say, mm -hmm. and those are those are inscribed upon lead. And most of the scholars who deal with these things seem to think that they're slightly earlier. I'm not sure how far back we can push those rolls. You know, like maybe if you're very ambitious, fourth century. If you go to the incantation bowls, the terracotta demon traps, those I would say are around the six or seven. They're, they're peri-Islamic, right? They were written before Islam. They continue to be written in the early centuries of Islam. And then at some point they stopped. They fell out of vogue and people stopped making them. Mm. I would also say based upon my study of the colophons, and this is something I'm actively engaged in right now, and about the history of the copyists and the figures who are mentioned within them, I think that there are some texts and some figures that we can um, trace back all the way to the middle of the third century, mm -hmm. right? Now, this is an argument that Yoram Buckley has also made with her own research in the Colophons, but in my most recent book, The Book of Kings and the Explanations of This World, I, I talk about, first of all, about um, coordinating the Mandaean calendar, this long, long calendar in terms of the years of Adam and whatnot, uh, with our current calendar, and then establishing the dates because the 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 uh, the Genzaraba, the, the great treasure of the Mandaeans, does have specific dates within it. Uh, establishing those within uh, with their uh, equivalents in the Gregorian calendar, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I can trace based on the Mandaean calendar some of these figures like Zazed Guazta all the way back to the middle of the third century. So that's as far as I can get uh, with Mandaean text, w working with Mandaean text themselves. The calendar, I should say as well, the um, epoch of this calendar, right, the first year of its era is the year uh, 323 before the Common Era. So it's, uh, it's similar to the Seleucid era, but it's off by about 11 or 12 years. And 
That is a calendar that my colleague and former mentor, Leo DePite at Brown University, who works on calendrics, that is a calendar that he's identified with other communities in the Middle East as well. They call it the Philippian era because it, uh, it dates from the advent of um, Philip Aradeus, the, the brother of the half brother of Alexander the Great. After Alexander the Great died, they inaugurated a new era based upon the rule of his brother. And for whatever reason, the epic of the Mandaean calendar is that year. It begins with the death of Alexander the Great. Um, now, why that is, I could not tell you. But it suggests to me that there are some institutions within Mandaism that predate even Christianity, predate John the Baptist, for example, right? Why would you have a calendar that begins in 323 before mm -hmm. the Common Era? So now it's clear that they could have adopted this calendar from another local community. Um, we're not sure exactly which community that would have been. But again, the question remains, why did they adopt this calendar? So. The question of the origins of the Mandaeans, uh, their, their, their long duration within history can be answered in numerous ways. If we're talking about the institution of their priests and their priesthood and their texts, then by sure, I can bring them back to the middle of the third century, right? With the Diwan of, uh, of Zazed Gwazta. Their calendar goes back even further. Uh, in terms of archaeological evidence, which is nice to have, right? We like to be able to point at buildings and right. artifacts and whatnot. Then we're talking about fourth, fifth, sixth century, ambitiously fourth, I would say fifth or sixth century is probably about as far as we can push it. Do you think that it's possible that maybe they had some kind of, maybe the early, the earliest Mandaeans had some kind of beef of Alexander the Great that we don't know about, he some could, lost history? He appears in their text. He appears in the Book of Kings. Hmm. Um, now, I have to say that in this chronicle, the kings are mentioned, and they're just sort of, barest little indications of something about their reigns and how they perceive them. Now, this is reading perhaps a little too much into that text, but mm -hmm. when I see it, I'm reminded of the Zoroastrian beef with Alexander the Great, right? It, as you probably are aware, mm -hmm. Zoroastrians view Alexander as, or as they call him, Alexander i Chromayig, right? This, this sort of like, almost like a demon who came and he destroyed um, the last Zoroastrian kingdom before, of course, before the Parthians and the Sasanians, right? He got rid of the Achaemenids. He destroyed all the sacred texts of the Zoroastrians, which is why the Avesta survives only in, in such a fragmentary way today. So they attribute all of this devilry to Alexander the, the, the Great. And I can't help but think that because Alexander the Great's name appears in the context of a list of Iranian kings, that they were familiar with the story, of course, and that might have conditioned somehow how they view um, his reign and his role in the Middle East. And by which uh, century is the Mandaean Book of John finished re when it reached its final form? Excellent question, right. I would say, <clears throat> I would probably say that it happened fairly early on in the history of Islam. And, you know, I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, uh, to the extent to which this would be a book to prove the prophetic um, mission of, the, of John the Baptist and of the Mandaeans, um, I don't think if anyone actually read the book who is not a Mandaean, they would come away with uh, warm, fuzzy feelings about Mandaeans' perceptions of Islam. I don't honestly think it was created as a way to placate Muslims because there's nothing really in I mean, it says the Arabs are, are, are they, 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 they hate the Jews, and yet they come from Jews, right? That's like a line within the book of John. Uh, you know, they practice circumcision like the Jews, and their book is like a kind of like a, 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 um, a version of the Torah, right? It comes from the Torah. So Mendians are quite open about their feelings about Islam in some of these later chapters of the, uh, 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 of the book of John. But I think that they could only get away with that early on in the history of Islam when it wasn't quite clear whether this community was here to stay. It, they were uh, Muslims in Mesopotamia were at that point a small minority. They would remain a tiny minority well into the medieval period in that area. And they could only really maintain their rule by uh, through negotiations um, with other local elites. And so I think you know, Mandaeans at that period in the history of Islam 
felt comfortable to produce a book which critiqued Islam in this way. I think um, that they didn't add much more to it after that. I don't actually see a whole lot of evidence for them adding more to it. And in fact, because a lot of these really late texts within the Book of John refer to the end of the Age of Mars, the era of Mars, which according to the Mandaean calendar, again, ends in 678, I have difficulty thinking that these texts would be written after that point, right? These criticisms of Mandaeans living at the end of the Age of Mars, these criticisms of the Arabs, these criticisms of what we would call Muslims, although they refer to them as Arabs. I, I suspect that these are all no later than the second half of the seventh century. So, and by the way, this, this opinion of mine, because it is only an opinion, uh, and I think it's, it's only basically supported by research, which still needs to be elaborated, is nonetheless supported by the long colophon chain of the Book of John. It's much longer than that of the Genzo Rabba. The, the, the colophon chain of the earliest manuscripts of the Book of John is very long, which suggests two things to me. Number one, that this book was frequently copied, that people had it in their homes or they were studying it. And that was important to the community for a very long time. Not just something to give to outsiders, but important to them. And number two, that the book that we know of the Ginza, which is clearly also a, a compilation of different books from different sources, actually became the Ginza, as we know and love it, much later in the medieval period than the Book of John. Right? I think the Book of John that we have today is an early compilation, and maybe even 7th century, right, in the early years of Islam. Whereas the Genza Rabba consists of a bunch of other very important texts, which also circulated around these times. But at some point in the Middle, middle Ages, Mendians decided, well, we, we'd like to have all of these important texts together in one single volume, right? Much like the canonization of the Bible in, in both the Christian and the Jewish tradition. Of course, the Jewish canonization of the Bible happened a lot earlier than the Christian canonization of the Bible. But when we read, for example, the commentaries of figures like St. Ephraim, among other Syriac fathers, they're clearly engaging with a Bible that's very different from the Bible that we use, right? Like, you know, uh, the Codex Ambrosianus, one of our earliest copies of the Syriac Bible, the Peshitta, is clearly a Bible, but it includes within it, um, in addition to many of the Apocrypha that we associate with, with those traditions, a copy, a, a portion of Josephus's Jewish Wars. What is that doing in it? No community today thinks that Josephus was a prophet uh, and that his Jewish wars is a biblical text. Uh, so, and there's no book of Revelation either in, in Codex Ambrosianus and in, in any of the early Peshitta copies. So my point is that the canonization of the Bible in the Syriac tradition and in other traditions as well took place over a long period of time, right? These texts circulated independently. And it really, if you ask me, it really wasn't until the advent of printing that we get like the Bible Bible that everyone can go to, you know, Barnes and Nobles and pick off the shelf, right? Before that, some texts were in the Bible, some texts were not, and these changed from, from century to century. So I see a parallel development with Mandaeans. I see this particularly with the Genza Rabba. I think that the Genza Rabba is a collection of sacred texts um, that finally coalesced in its current form later. In the book of John. And I think the book of John became what it is today very early on. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Charles Haberl. It's my pleasure to join you. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.